This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapters 18 and 19. Chapter 18. Six months afterwards, my friend, he was a cynical, more than middle-aged bachelor, with a reputation for eccentricity, and owned a rice mill, wrote to me, and judging from the warmth of my recommendation that I would like to hear, enlarged a little upon Jim's perfections. These were apparently of a quiet and effective sort. Not having been able so far to find more in my heart than a resigned toleration for any individual of my kind, I have lived till now alone in a house that even in this steaming climate could be considered as too big for one man. I have had him to live with me for some time past. It seems I haven't made a mistake. It seemed to me upon reading this letter that my friend had found in his heart more than tolerance for Jim, that there were the beginnings of active liking. Of course he stated his grounds in a characteristic way. For one thing, Jim kept his freshness in the climate. Had he been a girl, my friend wrote, one could have said he was blooming. Blooming modestly, like a violet, not like some of these blatant tropical flowers. He had been in the house for six weeks, and had not as yet attempted to slap him on the back, or address him as old boy, or try to make him feel a superannuated fossil. He had nothing of the exasperating young man's chatter. He was good-tempered, had not much to say for himself, was not clever by any means, thank goodness, wrote my friend. It appeared, however, that Jim was clever enough to be quietly appreciative of his wit, while, on the other hand, he amused him by his naiveness. The dew is yet on him, and since I had the bright idea of giving him a room in the house, and having him at meals, I feel less withered myself. The other day he took it into his head to cross the room with no other purpose but to open a door for me, and I felt much more in touch with mankind than I had been for years. Ridiculous, isn't it? Of course, I guess there is something, some awful little scrape, which you know about. But if I am sure that it is terribly heinous, I fancy one could manage to forgive it. For my part, I declare I am unable to imagine him guilty of anything much worse than robbing an orchard. Is it much worse? Perhaps you ought to have told me. But it is such a long time since we both turned saints that you may have forgotten we too have sinned in our time. It may be that some day I shall have to ask you, and then I shall expect to be told. I don't care to question him myself till I have some idea what it is. Moreover, it's too soon as yet. Let him open the door a few times more for me. Thus, my friend, I was trebly pleased, at Jim's shaping so well, at the tone of the letter, at my own cleverness. Evidently I had known what I was doing. I had read characters aright, and so on. And what if something unexpected and wonderful were to come of it? That evening, reposing in a deck-chair under the shade of my own poop awning, it was in Hong Kong Harbour, I laid on Jim's behalf the first stone of a castle in Spain. I made a trip to the northward, and when I returned I found another letter from my friend waiting for me. It was the first envelope I tore open. "'There are no spoons missing, as far as I know,' ran the first line. "'I haven't been interested enough to inquire. "'He is gone, leaving on the breakfast-table a formal little note of apology, "'which is either silly or heartless. "'Probably both, and it's all one to me. "'Allow me to say, lest you should have some more mysterious young men in reserve, "'that I have shut up shop, definitely and forever. "'This is the last eccentricity I shall be guilty of.' Do not imagine for a moment that I care a hang, but he is very much regretted at tennis parties, and for my own sake I have told a plausible lie at the club. I flung the letter aside and started looking through the batch at my table, till I came upon Jim's handwriting. Would you believe it? One chance in a hundred. But it is always that hundredth chance. 
That little second engineer of the Patna had turned up in a more or less destitute state, and got a temporary job of looking after the machinery of the mill. "'I couldn't stand the familiarity of the little beast,' Jim wrote from a seaport seven hundred miles south of the place where he should have been in Clover. "'I am now for the time with Egstrom and Blake, uh, ship-chandlers, as their, well, runner, to call the thing by its right name. For reference I gave them your name, which they know, of course, and if you could write a word in my favour it would be permanent employment.' I was utterly crushed under the ruins of my castle, but, of course, I wrote as desired. Before the end of the year my new charter took me that way, and I had an opportunity of seeing him. He was still with Egstrom and Blake, and we met in what they called our parlour, opening out of the store. He had that moment come in from boarding a ship, and confronted me head down, ready for a tussle. "'What have you got to say for yourself?' I began, as soon as we had shaken hands. "'What I wrote you. Nothing more,' he said stubbornly. "'Did the fellow blab, or what?' I asked. He looked up at me with a troubled smile. "'Oh, no, he didn't. He made it a kind of confidential business between us. He was most damnably mysterious whenever I came over to the mill. He would wink at me in a respectful manner, as much as to say— we know what we know, infernally fawning and familiar, and that sort of thing. He threw himself into a chair and stared down his legs. One day we happened to be alone, and the fellow had the cheek to say, Well, Mr. James, I was called Mr. James there, as if I'd been the son. Here we are together once more. This is better than the old ship, ain't it? Wasn't it appalling, eh? I looked at him, and he put on a knowing air. "'Don't you be uneasy, sir,' he says. "'I know a gentleman when I see one, and I know how a gentleman feels. I know, though, you will be keeping me on this job. I had a hard time of it, too, along of that rotten old Patna racket. Jove! It was awful. I don't know what I should have said or done if I had not just then heard Mr. Denver calling me in the passage.' It was tiffin time, and we walked together across the yard, and through the garden to the bungalow. He began to chaff me in his kindly way. I believe he liked me. Jim was silent for a while. I know he liked me. That's what made it so hard. Such a splendid man. That morning he slipped his hand under my arm. He, too, was familiar with me. He burst into a short laugh and dropped his chin on his breast. Puh! When I remembered how that mean little beast had been talking to me, he began suddenly in a vibrating voice. I couldn't bear to think of myself. I suppose you know. I nodded. More like a father, he cried. His voice sank. I would have had to tell him. I couldn't let it go on, could I? Well... I murmured, after waiting a while. "'I preferred to go,' he said slowly. "'This thing must be buried.' We could hear in the shop Blake upbraiding Egstrom in an abusive, strained voice. They had been associated for many years, and every day, from the moment the doors were opened to the last minute before closing, Blake, a little man with sleek jetty hair and unhappy, beady eyes, could be heard rowing his partner incessantly with a sort of scathing and plaintive fury. The sound of that everlasting scolding was part of the place like the other fixtures. Even strangers would very soon come to disregard it completely, unless it be perhaps to mutter nuisance or to get up suddenly and shut the door of the parlour. Egstrom himself, a raw-boned, heavy Scandinavian with a busy manner and immense blond whiskers, went on directing his people, checking parcels, making out bills, or writing letters at a stand-up desk in the shop, and comported himself in that clatter exactly as though he had been stone deaf. Now and again he would emit a bothered, perfunctory shh, which neither produced nor was expected to produce the slightest effect. "'They are very decent to me here,' said Jim. "'Blake's a little cad, but Egstrom's all right.' 
He stood up quickly, and walking with measured steps to a tripod telescope standing in the window and pointed at the roadstead, he applied his eye to it. "'There's that ship, which has been becalmed outside all the morning, has got a breeze now and is coming in,' he remarked patiently. "'I must go and board.' We shook hands in silence, and he turned to go. "'Jim!' I cried. He looked round with his hand on the lock. "'You... you have thrown away something like a fortune.' He came back to me all the way from the door. "'Such a splendid old chap,' he said. "'How could I? How could I?' His lips twitched. "'Here it does not matter. "'Oh, you... you...' I began, and had to cast about for a suitable word, but before I became aware that there was no name that would just do, he was gone. I heard outside Eggstrom's deep, gentle voice saying cheerily, "'That's the Sarah W. Granger, Jimmy. You must manage to be first aboard.' And directly Blake struck in, screaming after the manner of an outraged cockatoo, "'Tell the captain we've got some of his mail here. That'll fetch him. Do you hear, Mr. What's-your-name?' And there was Jim answering Eggstrom with something boyish in his tone. "'All right. I'll make a race of it.' He seemed to take refuge in the boat-sailing part of that sorry business. I did not see him again that trip, but on my next—I had a six-month's charter— I went up to the store. Ten yards away from the door, Blake's scolding met my ears, and when I came up he gave me a glance of utter wretchedness. Eggstrom, all smiles, advanced, extending a large, bony hand. "'Glad to see you, Captain. Shh! I've been thinking you were about due back here. What did you say, sir?' "'Shh! Oh, him. He has left us. Come into the parlour.' After the slam of the door— Blake's strained voice became faint, as the voice of one scolding desperately in a wilderness. "'Put us to great inconvenience, too. Used us badly, I must say.' "'Where's he gone to? Do you know?' I asked. "'No. It's no use asking, either,' said Eggstrom, standing bewhiskered and obliging before me, with his arms hanging down his sides clumsily, and a thin silver watch-chain looped very low on a rucked-up blue serge waistcoat. A man like that don't go anywhere in particular. I was too concerned at the news to ask for the explanation of that pronouncement, and he went on. He left, let's see, uh, the very day a steamer with returning pilgrims from the Red Sea put in here with two blades of a propeller gone. Three weeks ago now. Wasn't there something said about the Patna case? I asked, fearing the worst. He gave a start and looked at me as if I'd been a sorcerer. "'Why, yes. How do you know? Some of them were talking about it here. There was a captain or two, the manager of uh, Van Lowe's engineering shop at the harbour, two or three others, and myself. Jim was in here, too, having a sandwich and a glass of beer. When we are busy, you see, Captain, there's no time for a proper tiffin. He was standing by this table eating sandwiches, and the rest of us were round the telescope watching that steamer come in, and by and by Van Lowe's manager began uh, to talk about the chief of the Patna. He had done some repairs for him once, and from that he went on to tell us uh, what an old ruin she was, and the money that had been made out of her. He came to mention her last voyage, and then we all struck in. Some said one thing, and some said another, not much. But what you or any other man might say, and there was some laughing. Captain O'Brien of the Sarah W. Granger, a large, noisy old man with a stick, he was sitting listening to us in this armchair here. He let drive suddenly with his stick at the floor and roars out, Skunks! Made us all jump. Vanlo's manager winks at us and asks, What's the matter, Captain O'Brien? Matter? Matter? the old man began to shout. What are you injuns laughing at? It's no laughing matter. It's a disgrace to human nature, that's what it is. I would despise being seen in the same room with one of those men. Yes, sir. He seemed to catch me eye like, and I had to speak out of civility. Skunks, says I. Of course, Captain O'Brien, and I wouldn't care to have them here myself. 
So you're quite safe in this room, Captain O'Brien. Have a little something cool to drink. Damn your drink, Eggstrom, says he, with a twinkle in his eye. When I want a drink, I will shout for it. I'm going to quit. It stinks here now. At this all the others burst out laughing, and out they go after the old man. And then, sir, that blasted Jim, he puts down the sandwich he had in his hands, and walks round a table to me. There was a glass of beer poured out quite full. I am off, he says, just like this. It isn't half past one yet, I says I. You might snatch a smoke first. I thought he meant it was time for him to go down to his work. When I understood what he was up to, my arms fell. So, can't get a man like that every day, you know, sir, a regular devil for sailing a boat, ready to go out miles to sea to meet ships in any sort of weather. More than once the captain would come here full of it, and the first thing he would say would be, that's a reckless sort of lunatic you got for a water clerk, Eggstrom. I was feeling my way at daylight under short canvas when there comes flying out of the mist, right under my forefoot a boat half under water sprays going over the masthead two frightened niggers on the bottom boards a yelling fiend at the tiller hey hey ship ahoy captain hey hey eggstrom and blake's man first to speak to you hey hey eggstrom and blake hallo hey whoop kick the niggers out reef a squall on at the time shoots ahead whooping and yelling to me to make sail and he would give me a lead in more like a demon than a man Never saw a boat handled like that in all my life. Couldn't have been drunk, was he? Such a quiet, soft-spoken chap, too. Blushed like a girl when he came on board. I tell you, Captain Marlowe, nobody had a chance against us with a strange ship when Jim was out. The other ship chandlers just kept their old customers, and... Eggstrom appeared overcome with emotion. Why, sir... It seemed as though he wouldn't mind going a hundred miles out to sea in an old shoe to nab a ship for the firm. If the business had been his own and all to make yet, he couldn't have done more in that way. And now, all at once, like this, thinks I to myself, a ho, a rise in the screw. That's the trouble, is it? All right, says I, no need of all that fuss with me, Jimmy. Just mention your figure. Anything in reason." He looks at me as if he wanted to swallow something that stuck in his throat. I can't stop with you. What's that bloomin' joke, I asks. He shakes his head, and I could see in his eye he was as good as gone already, sir. So I turned to him and slanged him till all was blue. What is it you're running away from, I asks. Who has been getting at you? What scared you? You haven't as much sense as a rat. They don't clear out from a good ship. Where do you expect to get a better berth, you this and you that? I made him look sick, I can tell you. This business ain't going to sink, says I. He gave a big jump. Goodbye, he says, nodding at me like a lord. You ain't half a bad chap, Eggstrom. I give you my word that if you knew my reasons, you wouldn't care to keep me. That's the biggest lie you ever told in your life, says I. I know my mind. He made me so mad that I had to laugh. Can't you really stop long enough to drink this glass of beer here, you funny beggar, you? I don't know what came over him. He didn't seem able to find the door. Something comical, I can tell you, Captain. I drank the beer myself. Well, if you're in such a hurry, here's luck to you and your own drink, says I. Only you mark my words. If you keep up this game, you'll very soon find that the earth ain't big enough to hold you. That's all. He gave me one black look, and out he rushed with a face fit to scare little children. Eggstrom snorted bitterly, and combed one auburn whisker with knotty fingers. I haven't been able to get a man that was any good since. It's nothing but worry, worry, worry in business. And where might you have come across him, Captain, if it's fair to ask? He was the mate of the Patna, that voyage, I said, feeling that I owed some explanation. For a time Eggstrom remained very still, with his fingers plunged in the hair at the side of his face, and then exploded. And who the devil cares about that? I dare say no one, I began. And what the devil is he, anyhow, for to go on like this? He stuffed suddenly his left whisker into his mouth and stood amazed. <laughs> Gee, he exclaimed, I told him the earth wouldn't be big enough to hold his caper. 
Chapter 19 I have told you these two episodes at length to show his manner of dealing with himself under the new conditions of his life. There were many others of the sort, more than I could count on the fingers of my two hands. They were all equally tinged by a high-minded absurdity of intention that made their futility profound and touching. To fling away your daily bread so as to get your hands free for a grapple with a ghost may be an act of prosaic heroism. Men had done it before, though we who have lived know full well that it is not the haunted soul but the hungry body that makes an outcast, and men who had eaten and meant to eat every day applauded the creditable folly. He was indeed unfortunate, for all his recklessness could not carry him out from under the shadow. There was always a doubt of his courage. The truth seems to be that it is impossible to lay the ghost of a fact. You can face it or shirk it, and I have come across a man or two who could wink at their familiar shades. Obviously Jim was not of the winking sort, but what I could never make up my mind about was whether his line of conduct amounted to shirking his ghost or facing him out. I strained my mental eyesight only to discover that, as with the complexion of all our actions, the shade of difference was so delicate that it was impossible to say. It might have been flight, and it might have been a mode of combat. To the common mind he became known as a rolling stone, because this was the funniest part. He did, after a time, become perfectly known, and even notorious within the circle of his wanderings which had a diameter of, say, three thousand miles, in the same way as an eccentric character is known to the whole countryside. For instance, in Bangkok, where he found his employment with Yucker brothers, charterers, and teak merchants, it was almost pathetic to see him go about in sunshine hugging his secret, which was known to the very up-country logs on the river. Schomburg, the keeper of the hotel where he boarded, a hirsute Alsatian of manly bearing, and an irrepressible retailer of all the scandalous gossip of the place, would, with both elbows on the table, impart an adorned version of the story to any guest who cared to imbibe knowledge along with the more costly liquors. And, mind you, the nicest fellow you could meet would be his generous conclusion, quite superior. It says a lot for the casual crowd that frequented Schomburg's establishment that Jim managed to hang out in Bangkok for a whole six months. I remarked that people, perfect strangers, took to him as one takes to a nice child. His manner was reserved, but it was as though his personal appearance, his hair, his eyes, his smile, made friends for him wherever he went. And, of course, he was no fool." I heard Siegmund Jucker, native of Switzerland, a gentle creature ravaged by a cruel dyspepsia, and so frightfully lame that his head swung through a quarter of a circle at every step he took, declare appreciatively that for one so young he was of great capacity, as though it had been a mere question of cubic contents. Why not send him up country? I suggested anxiously. Yucca Brothers had concessions and teak forests in the interior. If he has capacity, as you say, he will soon get hold of the work, and physically is very fit. His health is always excellent. Ah! It is a great thing in this country to be free from dyspepsia, sighed poor Yucker enviously, casting a stealthy glance at the pit of his ruined stomach. I left him drumming pensively on his desk and muttering, Es ist ein Idee. Es ist ein Idee. Unfortunately, that very evening, an unpleasant affair took place in the hotel. I don't know that I blame Jim very much, but it was a truly regrettable incident. It belonged to the lamentable species of barroom scuffles, and the other party to it was a cross-eyed Dane of sorts, whose visiting card recited under his misbegotten name, First Lieutenant in the Royal Siamese Navy. The fellow, of course, was utterly hopeless at billiards, but did not like to be beaten, I suppose. He had had enough to drink to turn nasty after the sixth game, and make some scornful remark at Jim's expense. Most of the people there didn't hear what was said, and those who had heard 
seemed to have had all precise recollections scared out of them by the appalling nature of the consequences that immediately ensued. It was very lucky for the Dane that he could swim, because the room opened on a veranda and the menam flowed below very wide and black. A boatload of Chinamen, bound as likely as not on some thieving expedition, fished out the officer of the King of Siam, and Jim turned up at about midnight on board my ship without a hat. "'Everybody in the room seemed to know,' he said, gasping yet from the contest, as it were. He was rather sorry, on general principles, for what had happened, though in this case there had been, he said, "'no option.' But what dismayed him was to find the nature of his burden as well known to everybody as though he had gone about all that time carrying it on his shoulders. Naturally, after this, he couldn't remain in the place. He was universally condemned for the brutal violence so unbecoming a man in his delicate position. Some maintained he had been disgracefully drunk at the time. Others criticized his want of tact. Even Schomburg was very much annoyed. "'He is a very nice young man,' he said argumentatively to me. "'But the lieutenant is a first-rate fellow, too. "'He dines every night at my table d'hôte, you know. "'And there's a billiard cue broken. "'I can't allow that. Uh, First thing this morning I went over with my apologies to the lieutenant, "'and I think that I've made that all right for myself. Uh, "'But only think, Captain, if everybody started such games, "'why, the man might have been drowned.' "'And here I can't run out into the next street and buy a new queue. "'I've got to write to Europe for them. "'No, no, a temper like that won't do.' "'He was extremely sore on the subject. "'This was the worst incident of all in his, uh, his retreat. "'Nobody could deplore it more than myself. "'For if, as somebody said, hearing him mentioned, "'Oh, yes, I know, he has knocked about a good deal out here,' yet he had somehow avoided being battered and chipped in the process. This last affair, however, made me seriously uneasy, because if his exquisite sensibilities were to go the length of involving him in pothouse shindies, he would lose his name of an inoffensive, if aggravating, fool and acquire that of a common loafer. For all my confidence in him, I could not help reflecting that in such cases, from the name to the thing itself is but a step— I suppose you will understand by that time I could not think of washing my hands of him. I took him away from Bangkok in my ship, and we had a longish passage. It was pitiful to see how he shrank within himself. A seaman, even if a mere passenger, takes an interest in a ship and looks at the sea life around him with the critical enjoyment of a painter, for instance, looking at another man's work. In every sense of the expression he is on deck— but my Jim, for the most part, sulked down below as though he had been a stowaway. He infected me so that I avoided speaking on professional matters, such as would suggest themselves naturally to two sailors during a passage. For whole days we did not exchange a word. I felt extremely unwilling to give orders to my officers in his presence. Often, when alone with him on deck or in the cabin, we didn't know what to do with our eyes. I placed him with de Jong, as you know, glad enough to dispose of him in any way, yet persuaded that his position was now growing intolerable. He had lost some of that elasticity which had enabled him to rebound back into his uncompromising position after every overthrow. One day, coming ashore, I saw him standing on the quay. The water of the roadstead and the sea in the offing made one smooth ascending plain and the outermost ships at anchor seemed to ride motionless in the sky. He was waiting for his boat, which was being loaded at our feet with packages of small stores for some vessel ready to leave. After exchanging greetings, we remained silent, side by side. "'Jove!' he said suddenly. "'This is killing work!' He smiled at me. I must say he generally could manage a smile. I made no reply. I knew very well he was not alluding to his duties. He had an easy time of it with de Jong. Nevertheless, as soon as he had spoken, I became completely convinced that the work was killing. I did not even look at him. "'Would you like,' said I, "'to leave this part of the world altogether, 
try California or the West Coast. I'll see what I can do. He interrupted me a little scornfully. What difference would it make? I felt at once convinced that he was right. It would make no difference. It was not relief he wanted. I seemed to perceive dimly that what he wanted, what he was, as it were, waiting for, was something not easy to define, something in the nature of an opportunity. I had given him many opportunities, but they had been merely opportunities to earn his bread. Yet what more could any man do? The position struck me as hopeless, and poor Briarly's saying recurred to me. Let him creep twenty feet underground and stay there. Better that, I thought, than this waiting above ground for the impossible. Yet one could not be sure even of that. There and then, before his boat was three oars' lengths away from the quay, I had made up my mind to go and consult Stein in the evening. This Stein was a wealthy and respected merchant. His house, because it was a house, Stein and company, and there was some sort of partner who, as Stein said, looked after the Moluccas, had a large inter-island business with a lot of trading ports established in the most out-of-the-way places for collecting the produce. His wealth and respectability were not exactly the reasons why I was anxious to seek his advice. I desired to confide my difficulty to him because he was one of the most trustworthy men I had ever known. The gentle light of a simple, unwearied, as it were, and intelligent good nature illumined his long, hairless face. It had deep downward folds, and was pale as of a man who had always led a sedentary life, which was indeed very far from being the case. His hair was thin and brushed back from a massive and lofty forehead. One fancied that at twenty he must have looked very much like what he was now at threescore. It was a student's face. Only the eyebrows, nearly all white, thick and bushy, together with the resolute, searching glance that came from under them, were not in accord with his, I may say, learned appearance. He was tall and loose-jointed. His slight stoop, together with an innocent smile, made him appear benevolently ready to lend you his ear. His long arms, with pale, big hands, had rare, deliberate gestures of a pointing-out, demonstrating kind. I speak of him at length because, under this exterior, and in conjunction with an upright and indulgent nature, this man possessed an intrepidity of spirit and a physical courage that could have been called reckless, had it not been like a natural function of the body, say, good digestion, for instance, completely unconscious of itself. It is sometimes said of a man that he carries his life in his hand. Such a saying would have been inadequate if applied to him. During the early part of his existence in the East, he had been playing ball with it. All this was in the past, but I knew the story of his life and the origin of his fortune. He was also a naturalist of some distinction, or perhaps I should say a learned collector. Entomology was his special study. His collection of Bupresidae and Longicorns, beetles all, horrible miniature monsters looking malevolent in death and immobility, and his cabinet of butterflies, beautiful and hovering under the glass of cases on lifeless wings, had spread his fame far over the earth. The name of this merchant, adventurer, and sometime adviser of a Malay sultan, to whom he never alluded otherwise than as my poor Mohammed Bonso, had, on account of a few bushels of dead insects, become known to learned persons in Europe, who could have no conception and certainly would not have cared to know anything of his life or character. I, who knew, considered him an eminently suitable person to receive my confidences about Jim's difficulties as well as my own. End of chapters 18 and 19This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. 
Chapter 20 Late in the evening I entered his study, after traversing an imposing but empty dining-room, very dimly lit. The house was silent. I was preceded by an elderly, grim Javanese servant in a sort of livery of white jacket and yellow sarong, who, after throwing the door open, exclaimed low, "O oh, master!' and, stepping aside, vanished in a mysterious way, as though he had been a ghost only momentarily embodied for that particular service. Stein turned round with the chair, and, in the same movement, his spectacles seemed to get pushed up on his forehead. He welcomed me in his quiet and humorous voice. Only one corner of the vast room, the corner in which stood his writing-desk, was strongly lighted by a shaded reading-lamp, and the rest of the spacious apartment melted into shapeless gloom like a cavern. Narrow shelves filled with dark boxes of uniform shape and color ran round the walls, not from floor to ceiling, but in a sombre belt about four feet broad. Catacombs of beetles. Wooden tablets were hung above at irregular intervals. The light reached one of them, and the word Coleoptera, written in gold letters, glittered mysteriously upon a vast dimness. The glass cases containing the collection of butterflies were ranged in three long rows upon slender-legged little tables. One of these cases had been removed from its place and stood on the desk, which was bestrewn with oblong slips of paper blackened with minute handwriting. "'So you see me. So,' he said. His hand hovered over the case, where a butterfly in solitary grandeur spread out dark bronze wings, seven inches or more across, with exquisite white veinings and a gorgeous border of yellow spots. "'Only one specimen like this they have in your London, and then no more. <laughs> To my small native town, this my collection I shall bequeath. Something of me, the best. He bent forward in the chair and gazed intently, his chin over the front of the case. I stood at his back. Marvellous, he whispered, and seemed to forget my presence. His history was curious. He had been born in Bavaria, and when a youth of twenty-two had taken an active part in the revolutionary movement of 1848. Heavily compromised, he managed to make his escape, and at first found a refuge with a poor Republican watchmaker in Trieste. From there he made his way to Tripoli with a stock of cheap watches to hawk about. Not a very great opening, truly, but it turned out lucky enough, because it was there he came upon a Dutch traveller, a rather famous man, I believe, but I don't remember his name. It was that naturalist who, engaging him as a sort of assistant, took him to the east. They travelled the archipelago together and separately, collecting insects and birds for four years or more. Then the naturalist went home, and Stein, having no home to go to, remained with an old trader he had come across in his journeys in the interior of Celebes, if Celebes may be said to have an interior. This old Scotsman, the only white man allowed to reside in the country at the time, was a privileged friend of the chief ruler of Wajo States, who was a woman. I often heard Stein relate how that chap, who was slightly paralyzed on one side, had introduced him to the native court a short time before another stroke carried him off. He was a heavy man with a patriarchal white beard and of imposing stature. He came into the council hall, where all the rajas, panjarans, and headmen were assembled, with the queen, a fat, wrinkled woman, very free in her speech, Stein said, reclining on a high couch under a canopy. He dragged his leg, thumping with his stick, and grasped Stein's arm, leading him right up to the couch. "'Look, Queen, and your Rajas, this is my son,' he proclaimed in a stentorian voice. "'I have traded with your fathers, and when I die he shall trade with you and your sons.' By means of this simple formality, Stein inherited the Scotsman's privileged position and all his stock in trade, together with a fortified house on the banks of the only navigable river in the country. Shortly afterwards, the old Queen, who was so free in her speech, died. 
and the country became disturbed by various pretenders to the throne. Stein joined the party of a younger son, the one whom thirty years later he never spoke of otherwise but as my poor Mohammed Bonso. They both became the heroes of innumerable exploits, they had wonderful adventures, and once stood a siege in the Scotsman's house for a month, with only a score of followers against a whole army. I believe the natives talk of that war to this day. Uh, meantime, it seems, Stein never failed to annex to his own account every butterfly or beetle he could lay his hands on. After some eight years of war, negotiations, false truces, sudden outbreaks, reconciliation, treachery, and so on, and just as peace seemed at last permanently established, his poor Mohammed Bonso was assassinated at the gate of his own royal residence, while dismounting in the highest spirits on the return from a successful deer-hunt. This event rendered Stein's position extremely insecure, but he would have stayed, perhaps, had it not been that a short time afterwards he lost Mohammed's sister, my dear wife the princess, he used to say solemnly, by whom he had had a daughter, mother and child both dying within three days of each other from some infectious fever. He left the country which this cruel loss had made unbearable to him. Thus ended the first and adventurous part of his existence. What followed was so different that but for the reality of sorrow which remained with him, this strange part must have resembled a dream. He had a little money, he started life afresh, and in the course of years acquired a considerable fortune. At first he had travelled a good deal amongst the islands, but age had stolen upon him, and of late he seldom left his spacious house three miles out of town with an extensive garden, and surrounded by stables, offices, and bamboo cottages for his servants and dependents, of whom he had many. He drove in his buggy every morning to town, where he had an office with white and Chinese clerks. He owned a small fleet of schooners and native craft, and dealt in island produce on a large scale. For the rest he lived solitary, but not misanthropic, with his books in his collection, classing and arranging specimens, corresponding with entomologists in Europe, writing up a descriptive catalogue of his treasures. Such was the history of the man whom I had come to consult upon Jim's case, without any definite hope, simply to hear what he would have to say would have been a relief. I was very anxious, but I respected the intense, almost passionate absorption with which he looked at a butterfly, as though on the bronze sheen of these frail wings, in the white tracings, in the gorgeous markings, he could see other things, an image of something as perishable and defying destruction as these delicate and lifeless tissues displaying a splendor unmarred by death. Marvelous! he repeated, looking up at me. Look, the beauty, but that is nothing. Look at the accuracy, the harmony, and so fragile, and so strong, and so exact. This is nature, the balance of colossal forces. Every star is so, and every blade of grass stands so, and the mighty cosmos in perfect equilibrium produces this this wonder, this masterpiece of nature, the great artist. Never heard an entomologist go on like this, I observed cheerfully. Masterpiece? And what of man? Man is amazing, but he is not a masterpiece, he said, keeping his eyes fixed on the glass case. Perhaps the artist was a little mad, eh? <laughs> what do you think? Sometimes it seems to me that man is come where he is not wanted, where there is no place for him. For if not, why should he want all the place? Why should he run about here and there, making a great noise about himself, talking about the stars, disturbing the blades of grass, catching butterflies, I chimed in. He smiled, threw himself back in his chair, and stretched his legs. "'Sit down,' he said. "'I captured this rare specimen myself one very fine morning, "'and I had a very big emotion. 
you don't know what it is for a collector to capture such a rare specimen you can't know i smiled at my ease in a rocking chair his eyes seemed to look far beyond the wall at which they stared and he narrated how one night a messenger arrived from his poor mohammed requiring his presence at the residence as he called it which was distant some nine or ten miles by a bridle path over a cultivated plain with patches of forest here and there early in the morning he started from his fortified house after embracing his little emma and leaving the princess his wife in command he described how she came with him as far as the gate walking with one hand on the neck of his horse she had on a white jacket gold pins in her hair and a brown leather belt over her left shoulder with a revolver in it she talked as women will talk he said telling me to be careful and to try to get back before dark and what a great wickedness it was for me to go alone we were at war and the country was not safe my men were putting up bullet-proof shutters to the house and loading their rifles and she begged me to have no fear for her she could defend the house against anybody till i returned and i laughed with pleasure a little i like to see her so brave and young and strong i was young too then at the gate she caught hold of my hand and gave it one squeeze and fell back i made my horse stand still outside till i heard the bars of the gate put up behind me there was a great enemy of mine a great noble and a great rascal too roaming with a band in the neighbourhood i cantered four or five miles there had been rain in the night but the mists had gone up up and the face of the earth was clean it lay smiling at me so fresh and innocent like a little child uh, suddenly somebody fires a volley twenty shots at least it seemed to me i hear bullets sing in my ear and my hat jumps to the back of my head it was a little intrigue you understand they got my poor mohammed to send for me and then laid that ambush i see it all in a minute and i think this wants a little management my pony snort jump and stand and i fall slowly forward with my head on his mane he begins to walk and with one eye i could see over his neck a faint cloud of smoke hanging in front of a clump of bamboos to my left i think aha my friends why you not wait long enough before you shoot this is not yet gelungen <laughs> oh no i get hold of my revolver with my right hand quiet quiet after all there were only seven of these rascals they get up from the grass and start running with their sarongs tucked up waving spears above their head and yelling to each other to look out and catch the horse because i was dead i let them come as close as the door here and then bang 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 take aim each time too one more shot i fire at a man's back but i miss too far already and then i sit alone on my horse with the clean earth smiling at me and there are the bodies of three men lying on the ground one was curled up like a dog another on his back had an arm over his eyes as if to keep off the sun and the third man he draws up his leg very slowly and makes it with one kick straight again i watch him very carefully from my horse but there is no more bleibt ganz ruhig uh, keep still so and as i looked at his face for some sign of life i observed something like a faint shadow pass over his forehead it was the shadow of this butterfly look at the form of the wing this species fly high with a strong flight i raised my eyes and i saw him fluttering away i think can it be possible and then i lost him i dismounted and went on very slow leading my horse and holding my revolver with one hand and my eyes darting up and down and right and left everywhere at last i saw him sitting on a small heap of dirt ten feet away at once my heart began to beat quick i let go my horse keep my revolver in one hand and with the other snatch my soft felt hat off my head one step steady another step flop i got him when i got up i shook like a leaf with excitement 
and when I opened up these beautiful wings and made sure what a rare and so extraordinarily perfect specimen I had, my head went round and my legs became so weak with emotion that I had to sit on the ground. I had greatly desired to possess myself of a specimen of that species when collecting for the professor. I took long journeys and underwent great privations. I had dreamed of him in my sleep, and here suddenly I had him in my fingers for myself. In the words of the poet, he pronounced it Boet, So halt ich endlich dein in meinen Handen, und nenn es in gewissen Sinne mine. He gave to the last word the emphasis of a suddenly lowered voice, and withdrew his eyes slowly from my face. He began to charge a long-stemmed pipe, busily and in silence, then, pausing with his thumb on the orifice of the bowl, looked at me again significantly. Yes, my good friend, on that day I had nothing to desire. I had greatly annoyed my principal enemy. I was young, strong, I had friendship, I had the luff, he said luff, of a woman, a child I had to make my heart very full, and even what I had once dreamed in my sleep had come into my hands too. He struck a match which flared violently. His thoughtful, placid face twitched once. Friend, wife, child, he said slowly, gazing at the small flame. <sighs> the match was blown out. He sighed and turned again to the glass case. The frail and beautiful wings quivered faintly, as if his breath had for an instant called back to life that gorgeous object of his dreams. "'The work!' he began suddenly, pointing to the scattered slips, and in his usual gentle and cheery tone, "'is making great progress. I have been this rare specimen describing. Now, now what is your good news?' To tell you the truth, Stein, I said with an effort that surprised me, I came here to describe a specimen. Butterfly, he asked with an unbelieving and humorous eagerness. Nothing so perfect, I answered, feeling suddenly dispirited with all sorts of doubts. A man. Ah, so, he murmured, and his smiling countenance turned to me became grave. Then, after looking at me for a while, he said slowly, "'Well, I am a man, too.' Here you have him as he was. He knew how to be so generously encouraging as to make a scrupulous man hesitate on the brink of confidence. But if I did hesitate, it was not for long. He heard me out, sitting with crossed legs. Sometimes his head would disappear completely in a great eruption of smoke— and a sympathetic growl would come out from the cloud. When I finished, he uncrossed his legs, laid down his pipe, leaned forward towards me earnestly with his elbows on the arms of his chair, the tips of his fingers together. I understand very well. He is romantic. He had diagnosed the case for me, and at first I was quite startled to find out how simple it was. And, indeed, our conference resembled so much a medical consultation, Stein of learned aspect sitting in an armchair before his desk, I anxious in another facing him but a little to one side, that it seemed natural to ask, what's good for it? He lifted up a long forefinger. There is only one remedy. One thing alone can us from being ourselves cure. The finger came down on the desk with a smart rap. The case which he had made to look so simple before became, if possible, still simpler, and altogether hopeless. There was a pause. Yes, said I. Strictly speaking, the question is not how to get cured, but how to live. He approved with his head, a little sadly as it seemed. Ja, ja. In general, adapting the words of your great poet, that is the question, he went on, nodding sympathetically. How to be, ah, how to be. He stood up with the tips of his fingers resting on the desk. 
we want in so many different ways to be he began again this magnificent butterfly finds a little heap of dirt and sits still on it but man he will never on his heap of mud keep still he wants to be so and again he wants to be so he moved his hand up then down he wants to be a saint and he wants to be a devil and every time he shuts his eyes he sees himself as a very fine fellow so fine as he can never be in a dream he lowered the glass lid the automatic lock clicked sharply and taking up the case in both hands he bore it religiously away to its place passing out of the bright circle of the lamp into the ring of fainter light into the shapeless dusk at last it had an odd effect as if these few steps had carried him out of this concrete and perplexed world his tall form as though robbed of its substance hovered noiselessly over invisible things with stooping and indefinite movements his voice heard in that remoteness where he could be glimpsed mysteriously busy with immaterial cares was no longer incisive seemed to roll voluminous and grave mellowed by distance and because you not always can keep your eyes shut there comes the real trouble the heart pain the world pain i tell you my friend it is not good for you to find you cannot make your dream come true for the reasons that you are not strong enough or not clever enough yeah and all the time you are such a fine fellow too we was gott in himmel how can that be <laughs> the shadow prowling amongst the graves of butterflies laughed boisterously yes very funny this terrible thing is a man that is born falls into a dream like a man who falls into the sea if he tries to climb out into the air as inexperienced people endeavour to do he drowns nicht wahr no i tell you the way is to the destructive element submit yourself and with the exertions of your hand and feet in the water make the deep deep sea keep you up so if you ask me how to be his voice leaped up extraordinarily strong as though away there in the dusk he had been inspired by some whisper of knowledge i will tell you for that too there is only one way with a hasty swish swish of his slippers he loomed up in the ring of faint light and suddenly appeared in the bright circle of the lamp his extended hand aimed at my breast like a pistol his deep-set eyes seemed to pierce through me but his twitching lips uttered no word and the austere exultation of a certitude seen in the dusk vanished from his face the hand that had been pointing at my breast fell and by and by coming a step nearer he laid it gently on my shoulder there were things he said mournfully that perhaps could never be told only he had lived so much alone that sometimes he forgot he forgot the light had destroyed the assurance which had inspired him in the distant shadows he sat down and with both elbows on the desk rubbed his forehead and yet it is true it is true in the destructive element immerse he spoke in a subdued tone without looking at me one hand on each side of his face that was the way to follow the dream and again to follow the dream and so ewig usque ad finem the whisper of his conviction seemed to open before me a vast and uncertain expanse as of a crepuscular horizon on a plain at dawn or was it perchance the coming of the night one had not the courage to decide but it was a charming and deceptive light throwing the impalpable poesy of its dimness over pitfalls, over graves. His life had begun in sacrifice, in enthusiasm for generous ideas. He had travelled very far on various ways, on strange paths, and whatever he followed it had been without faltering, and therefore without shame and without regret. 
in so far he was right. That was the way, no doubt. Yet for all that, the great plain on which men wander amongst graves and pitfalls remained very desolate under the impalpable poesy of its crepuscular light, overshadowed in the centre, circled with a bright edge, as if surrounded by an abyss full of flames. When at last I broke the silence, it was to express the opinion that no one could be more romantic than himself. He shook his head slowly, and afterwards looked at me with a patient and inquiring glance. It was a shame, he said. There we were, sitting and talking like two boys, instead of putting our heads together to find something practical, a practical remedy for the evil, for the great evil, he repeated, with a humorous and indulgent smile. For all that, our talk did not grow more practical. We avoided pronouncing Jim's name as though we had tried to keep flesh and blood out of our discussion, or he were nothing but an erring spirit, a suffering and nameless shade. Nah, said Stein, rising. Tonight you sleep here, and in the morning we shall do something practical. Practical. He lit a two-branched candlestick and led the way. We passed through empty, dark rooms, escorted by gleams from the lights Stein carried. They glided along the waxed floors, sweeping here and there over the polished surface of a table, leaped upon a fragmentary curve of a piece of furniture, or flashed perpendicularly in and out of distant mirrors, while the forms of two men and the flicker of two flames could be seen for a moment stealing silently across the depths of a crystalline void. He walked slowly a pace in advance, with stooping courtesy. There was a profound, as it were, a listening quietude on his face. The long flaxen locks, mixed with white threads, were scattered thinly upon his slightly bowed neck. "'He is romantic, romantic,' he repeated. "'And that is very bad, very bad. "'Very good, too,' he added." "'But is he?' I queried. "'Gewiss,' he said, and stood still, holding up the candelabrum, but without looking at me. "'Evident! What is it that by inward pain makes him know himself? What is it that for you and me makes him exist?' At that moment it was difficult to believe in Jim's existence. Starting from a country parsonage, blurred by crowds of men as by clouds of dust, silenced by the clashing claims of life and death in a material world. But his imperishable reality came to me with a convincing, with an irresistible force. I saw it vividly, as though in our progress through the lofty, silent rooms, amongst fleeting gleams of light, and the sudden revelations of human figures stealing with flickering flames within unfathomable and pellucid depths, we had approached nearer to absolute truth, which, like beauty itself, floats elusive, obscure, half-submerged in the silent, still waters of mystery. "'Perhaps he is,' I admitted with a slight laugh, whose unexpectedly loud reverberation made me lower my voice directly. "'But I am sure you are.' With his head dropping on his breast and the light held high, he began to walk again. "'Well, I exist too.' he said. He preceded me. My eyes followed his movements, but what I did see was not the head of the firm, the welcome guest at afternoon receptions, the correspondent of learned societies, the entertainer of stray naturalists. I saw only the reality of his destiny, which he had known how to follow with unfaltering footsteps, that life begun in humble surroundings, rich in generous enthusiasms, in friendship, love, war, in all the exalted elements of romance. At the door of my room he faced me. Yes, I said, as though carrying on a discussion, and amongst other things you dreamed foolishly of a certain butterfly. But when one fine morning your dream came in your way, you did not let the splendid opportunity escape did you? Whereas he... Stein lifted his hand. And do you know how many opportunities I let escape? How many dreams I had lost that had come in my way? 
He shook his head regretfully. "'It seems to me that some would have been very fine if I had made them come true. Do you know how many? Perhaps I myself don't know.' "'Whether his were fine or not,' I said, "'he knows of one which he certainly did not catch. Everybody knows of one or two like that.' said Stein, and that is the trouble, the great trouble. He shook hands on the threshold, peered into my room under his raised arm. Sleep well, on tomorrow we must do something practical, practical. Though his own room was beyond mine, I saw him return the way he came. He was going back to his butterflies. End of chapter 20。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapters 21 and 22. Chapter 21. "'I don't suppose any of you have ever heard of Patizan,' Marlow resumed, after a silence occupied in the careful lighting of a cigar. "'It does not matter. There's many a heavenly body in the lot crowding upon us of a night that mankind has never heard of, it being outside the sphere of its activities and of no earthly importance to anybody, but to the astronomers who are paid to talk learnedly about its composition, weight, path, the irregularities of its conduct, the aberrations of its light, a sort of scientific scandal-mongering. Thus with Patizan. It was referred to knowingly in the inner government circles in Batavia, especially as to its irregularities and aberrations, and it was known by name to some few, very few, in the mercantile world. Nobody, however, had been there and I suspect no one desired to go there in person, just as an astronomer, I should fancy, would strongly object to being transported into a distant heavenly body, where, parted from his earthly emoluments, he would be bewildered by the view of an unfamiliar heavens. However, neither heavenly bodies nor astronomers have anything to do with Patizan. It was Jim who went there. I only meant you to understand that, had Stein arranged to send him to a star of the fifth magnitude, the change could not have been greater. He left his earthly failings behind him, and what sort of reputation he had, and there was a totally new set of conditions for his imaginative faculty to work upon, entirely new, entirely remarkable, and he got hold of them in a remarkable way. Stein was the man who knew more about Patizan than anybody else, more than was known in the government circles, I suspect. I have no doubt he had been there, either in his butterfly-hunting days, or later on, when he tried, in his incorrigible way, to season with a pinch of romance the fattening dishes of his commercial kitchen. There were very few places in the archipelago he had not seen in the original dusk of their being before light— and even electric light, had been carried into them for the sake of better morality and, and, well, the greater profit, too. It was at breakfast of the morning following our talk about Jim that he mentioned the place, after I had quoted poor Briarly's remark, let him creep twenty feet underground and stay there. He looked up at me with interested attention, as though I had been a rare insect, "'This could be done, too,' he remarked, sipping his coffee. "'Bury him in some sort,' I explained. "'One doesn't like to do it, of course, but it would be the best thing, seeing what he is.' "'Yes, he is young,' Stein mused. "'The youngest human being now in existence,' I affirmed. "'Schön. There's Patizan,' he went on in the same tone. "'And the woman is dead now.' he added incomprehensibly. Of course, I don't know that story. I can only guess that once before, Patizan had been used for the grave of some sin, transgression, or misfortune. It is impossible to suspect Stein. 
The only woman that had ever existed for him was the Malay girl he called my wife the princess, or, more rarely, in moments of expansion, the mother of my Emma. Who was the woman he had mentioned in connection with Patizan, I can't say, but from his allusions I understand she had been an educated and very good-looking Dutch Malay girl with a tragic, or perhaps only a pitiful, history, whose most painful part, no doubt, was her marriage with a Malacca Portuguese who had been a clerk in some commercial house in the Dutch colonies. I gathered from Stein that this man was an unsatisfactory person in more ways than one, all being more or less indefinite and offensive. It was solely for his wife's sake that Stein had appointed him manager of Stein and Company's trading post in Patizan, but commercially the arrangement was not a success, at any rate for the firm, and now the woman had died, Stein was disposed to try another agent there. The Portuguese, whose name was Cornelius, considered himself a very deserving but ill-used person, entitled by his abilities to a better position. This man Jim would have to relieve. "'But I don't think he will go away from the place,' remarked Stein. "'That has nothing to do with me. "'It was only for the sake of the woman that I... Uh... "'But I think there is a daughter left. "'I shall let him, if he likes, stay, keep the old house.' "'Patizan is a remote district of a native-ruled state, "'and the chief settlement bears the same name. "'At a point on the river, about forty miles from the sea, "'where the first houses come into view,' There can be seen rising above the level of the forest the summits of two steep hills very close together, and separated by what looks like a deep fissure, the cleavage of some mighty stroke. As a matter of fact, the valley between is nothing but a narrow ravine. The appearance from the settlement is of one irregularly conical hill split in two, and with the two halves leaning slightly apart. On the third day after the full, the moon is seen from the open space in front of Jim's house. He had a very fine house in the native style when I visited him. Rose exactly behind these hills, its diffused light at first throwing the two massives into intensely black relief, and then the nearly perfect disc glowing ruddily appeared, gliding upwards between the sides of the chasm till it floated away above the summits, as if escaping from a yawning grave in gentle triumph. "'Wonderful effect,' said Jim by my side. "'Worth seeing, is it not?' And this question was put with a note of personal pride that made me smile, as though he had had a hand in regulating that unique spectacle. He had regulated so many things in Patizan, things that would have appeared as much beyond his control as the motions of the moon and the stars. It was inconceivable. That was the distinctive quality of the part into which Stein and I had tumbled him unwittingly, with no other notion than to get him out of the way, out of his own way, be it understood. That was our main purpose, though I own I might have had another motive which had influenced me a little. I was about to go home for a time, and it may be I desired, more than I was aware of myself, to dispose of him to dispose of him, you understand, before I left. I was going home, and he had come to me from there, with his miserable trouble and his shadowy claim, like a man panting under a burden in a mist. I could not say I had ever seen him distinctly, not even to this day after I had my last view of him. But it seemed to me that the less I understood, the more I was bound to him in the name of that doubt which is the inseparable part of our knowledge. I did not know so much more about myself. And then, I repeat, I was going home, to that home distant enough for all its hearthstones to be like one hearthstone, by which the humble of us has a right to sit. We wander in our thousands over the face of the earth, the illustrious and the obscure, earning beyond the sea our fame, our money, or only a crust of bread, but it seems to me that for each of us going home must be like going to render an account. We return to face our superiors, our kindred, our friends, those whom we obey, those whom we love. 
but even they who have neither, the most free, lonely, irresponsible, and bereft of ties, even those for whom home holds no dear face, no familiar voice, even they have to meet the spirit that dwells within the land, under its sky, in its air, in its valleys, and on its rises, in its fields, in its waters, and its trees, a mute friend, judge, and inspirer. Say what you like, to get its joy, to breathe its peace, to face its truth, one must return with a clear conscience. All this may seem to you sheer sentimentalism, and indeed very few of us have the will or the capacity to look consciously under the surface of familiar emotions. There are the girls we love, the men we look up to, the tenderness, the friendships, the opportunities, the pleasures, but the fact remains that you must touch your reward with clean hands, lest it turn to dead leaves, to thorns in your grasp. I think it is the lonely, without a fireside or an affection they may call their own, those who return not to a dwelling but to the land itself, to meet its disembodied, eternal, and unchangeable spirit. It is those who understand best its severity, its saving power, the grace of its secular right to our fidelity, to our obedience. Yes, a few of us understand. But we all feel it, though, and I say all without exception, because those who do not feel do not count. Each blade of grass has its spot on the earth whence it draws its life, its strength, and so is man rooted to the land from which he draws his faith together with his life. I don't know how much Jim understood, but I know he felt, he felt confusedly but powerfully, the demand of some such truth or some such illusion. I don't care how you call it, there is so little difference, and the difference means so little. The thing is that in virtue of his feeling he mattered. He would never go home now, not he, never. Had he been capable of picturesque manifestations, he would have shuddered at the thought, and made you shudder too. But he was not of that sort, though he was expressive enough in his way. Before the idea of going home he would grow desperately stiff and immovable, with lowered chin and pouted lips, and with those candid blue eyes of his glowering darkly under a frown, as if before something unbearable, as if before something revolting. There was imagination in that hard skull of his, over which the thick clustering hair fitted like a cap. As to me, I have no imagination. I would be more certain about him to-day if I had. And I do not mean to imply that I figured to myself the spirit of the land uprising above the white cliffs of Dover to ask me what I, returning with no bones broken, so to speak, had done with my very young brother. I could not make such a mistake. I knew very well he was one of those about whom there is no inquiry. I had seen better men go out, disappear, vanish utterly, without provoking a sound of curiosity or sorrow. The spirit of the land, as becomes the ruler of great enterprises, is careless about innumerable lives. Woe to the stragglers! We exist only in so far as we hang together. He had straggled in a way, he had not hung on, but he was aware of it with an intensity that made him touching, just as a man's more intense life makes his death more touching than the death of a, a tree. I happened to be handy, and I happened to be touched. That's all there is to it. I was concerned as to the way he would go out. It would have hurt me if, for instance, he had taken to drink. The earth is so small that I was afraid of some day being waylaid by a blear-eyed, swollen-faced, besmirched loafer with no soles to his canvas shoes, and with a flutter of rags about the elbows, who, on the strength of old acquaintance, would ask for a loan of five dollars. You know the awful, jaunty bearing of these scarecrows coming to you from a decent past, the rasping, careless voice, the half-averted, impudent glances. Those meetings more trying to a man who believes in the solidarity of our lives than the sight of an impenitent deathbed to a priest. That, to tell you the truth, was the only danger I could see for him and for me. But I also mistrusted my want of imagination. 
It might even come to something worse, in some way it was beyond my powers of fancy to foresee. He wouldn't let me forget how imaginative he was, and your imaginative people swing farther in any direction, as if given a longer scope of cable in the uneasy anchorage of life. They do. They take to drink, too. It may be I was belittling him by such a fear. How could I tell? Even Stein could say no more than that he was romantic. I only knew he was one of us. And what business had he to be romantic? I am telling you so much about my own instinctive feelings and bemused reflections, because there remains so little to be told of him. He existed for me, and, after all, it is only through me that he exists for you. I have led him out by the hand. I have paraded him before you. Were my commonplace fears unjust? I won't say. Not even now. You may be able to tell better, since the proverb has it that the onlookers see most of the game. At any rate, they were superfluous. He did not go out, not at all. On the contrary, he came on wonderfully, came on straight as a die in an excellent form, which showed that he could stay as well as spurt. I ought to be delighted, for it is a victory in which I had taken my part. But I am not so pleased as I would have expected to be. I ask myself whether his rush had really carried him out of that mist in which he loomed, interesting, if not very big, with floating outlines, a straggler yearning inconsolably for his humble place in the ranks. And besides, the last word is not said, probably shall never be said. Are not our lives too short for that full utterance, which through all our stammerings is of course our only and abiding intention? I have given up expecting those last words, whose ring, if they could only be pronounced, would shake both heaven and earth. There is never time to say our last word, the last word of our love, of our desire, faith, remorse, submissions, revolt. The heaven and the earth must not be shaken, I suppose, at least not by us who know so many truths about either. My last words about Jim shall be few. I affirm he had achieved greatness, but the thing would be dwarfed in the telling, or rather in the hearing. Frankly, it is not my words that I mistrust, but uh, your minds. I could be eloquent were I not afraid you fellows had starved your imaginations to feed your bodies. I do not mean to be offensive. It is respectable to have no illusions, and safe, and profitable, and dull. Yet you, too, in your time must have known the intensity of life, that light of glamour created in the shock of trifles, as amazing as the glow of sparks struck from a cold stone, and as short-lived, alas. CHAPTER Twenty Two. The conquest of love, honour, men's confidence, the pride of it, the power of it, are fit materials for a heroic tale. Only our minds are struck by the externals of such a success, and to Jim's successes there were no externals. Thirty miles of forest shut it off from the sight of an indifferent world, and the noise of the white surf along the coast overpowered the voice of fame. The stream of civilization, as if divided on a headland a hundred miles north of Patizan, branches east and southeast, leaving its plains and valleys, its old trees and its old mankind, neglected and isolated, such as an insignificant and crumbling islet between two branches of a mighty devouring stream. You find the name of the country pretty often in collections of old voyages, the seventeenth-century traders went there for pepper, because the passion for pepper seemed to burn like a flame of love in the breasts of Dutch and English adventurers about the time of James I. Where wouldn't they go for pepper? For a bag of pepper they would cut each other's throats without hesitation, and would forswear their souls, of which they were so careful otherwise. The bizarre obstinacy of that desire made them defy death in a thousand shapes, the unknown seas, the loathsome and strange diseases, wounds, captivity, hunger, pestilence, and despair. It made them great. By heavens, it made them heroic. 
and it made them pathetic, too, in their craving for trade with the inflexible death levying its toll on young and old. It seems impossible to believe that mere greed could hold men to such a steadfastness of purpose, to such a blind persistence in endeavour and sacrifice, and indeed those who adventured their persons and lives risked all they had for a slender reward. They left their bones to lie bleaching on distant shores so that wealth might flow to the living at home. To us, their less tried successors, they appear magnified, not as agents of trade, but as instruments of a recorded destiny, pushing out into the unknown in obedience to an inward voice, to an impulse beating in the blood, to a dream of the future. They were wonderful, and it must be owned that they were ready for the wonderful. They recorded it complacently in their sufferings, in the aspect of the seas, in the customs of strange nations, in the glory of splendid rulers. In Patizan they had found lots of pepper, and had been impressed by the magnificence and the wisdom of the sultan. But somehow, after a century of checkered intercourse, the country seems to drop gradually out of the trade. Perhaps the pepper had given out. Be it as it may, nobody cares for it now. The glory has departed. The sultan is an imbecile youth with two thumbs on his left hand, and an uncertain and beggarly revenue, extorted from a miserable population and stolen from him by his many uncles. This, of course, I have from Stein. He gave me their names and a short sketch of the life and character of each. He was as full of information about native states as an official report, but uh, infinitely more amusing. He had to know. He traded in so many, and in some districts, as in Patizan, for instance, his firm was the only one to have an agency by special permit from the Dutch authorities. The government trusted his discretion, and it was understood that he took all the risks. The men he employed understood that, too, but he made it worth their while, apparently. He was perfectly frank with me over the breakfast-table in the morning. As far as he was aware, the last news was thirteen months old, he stated precisely, utter insecurity for life and property was the normal condition. There were in Patizan antagonistic forces, and one of them was Raja Alang, the worst of the sultan's uncles, the governor of the river, who did the extorting and the stealing, and ground down to the point of extinction the country-born Malays, who, utterly defenceless, had not even the resource of emigrating. For indeed, as Stein remarked, where could they go, and how could they get away? No doubt they did not even desire to get away. The world, which is circumscribed by lofty, impassable mountains, has been given into the hands of the high-born, and this Rajah they knew. He was of their own royal house. I had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman later on, he was a dirty, little, used-up old man, with evil eyes and a weak mouth who swallowed an opium pill every two hours, and in defiance of common decency wore his hair uncovered and falling in wild, stringy locks about his wizened, grimy face. When giving audience he would clamber upon a sort of narrow stage erected in a hall like a ruinous barn with a rotten bamboo floor, through the cracks of which you could see twelve or fifteen feet below, the heaps of refuse and garbage of all kinds lying under the house. That is where and how he received us when, accompanied by Jim, I paid him a visit of ceremony. There were about forty people in the room, and perhaps three times as many in the great courtyard below. There was a constant movement, coming and going, pushing and murmuring at our backs. A few youths in gay silks glared from the distance. The majority, slaves and humble dependents, were half-naked in ragged sarongs, dirty with ashes and mud-stains. I had never seen Jim look so grave, so self-possessed, in an impenetrable, impressive way. In the midst of these dark-faced men, his stalwart figure in white apparel, the gleaming clusters of his fair hair seemed to catch all the sunshine that trickled through the cracks in the closed shutters of that dim hall with its walls of mats and a roof of thatch. He appeared like a creature not only of another kind, but of another essence. Had they not seen him come up in a canoe, they might have thought that he had descended upon them from the clouds. 
He did, however, come in a crazy dugout, sitting very still and with his knees together for fear of overturning the thing, uh, sitting on a tin box which I had lent him, nursing on his lap a revolver of the navy pattern presented by me on parting, which, through an interposition of providence, or through some wrong-headed notion that was just like him, or else from sheer instinctive sagacity, he had decided to carry unloaded. That's how he ascended the Patizan River. Nothing could have been more prosaic and more unsafe, more extravagantly casual, more lonely. Strange, this fatality that would cast the complexion of a flight upon all his acts, of impulsive, unreflecting desertion of the jump into the unknown. It is precisely the casualness of it that strikes me most. Neither Stein nor I had a clear conception of what might be on the other side when we, metaphorically speaking, took him up and hove him over the wall with scant ceremony. At the moment I merely wished to achieve his disappearance. Stein, characteristically enough, had a sentimental motive. He had a notion of paying off, in kind, I suppose, the old debt he had never forgotten. Indeed, he had been all his life especially friendly to anybody from the British Isles. His late benefactor, it is true, was a Scot, even to the length of being called Alexander McNeil, and Jim came from a long way south of the Tweed. But at a distance of six or seven thousand miles, Great Britain, though never diminished, looks foreshortened enough even to its own children to rob such details of their importance. Stein was excusable, and his hinted intentions were so generous that I begged him most earnestly to keep them secret for a time. I felt that no consideration of personal advantage should be allowed to influence Jim, that not even the risk of such influence should be run. We had to deal with another sort of reality. He wanted a refuge, and a refuge at the cost of danger should be offered him. Nothing more. Upon every other point I was perfectly frank with him, and I even, as I believed at the time, exaggerated the danger of the undertaking. As a matter of fact, I did not do it justice. His first day on Patizan was nearly his last— would have been his last if he had not been so reckless or so hard on himself and had condescended to load that revolver. I remember, as I unfolded our precious scheme for his retreat, how his stubborn but weary resignation was gradually replaced by surprise, interest, wonder, and by boyish eagerness. This was the chance he had been dreaming of. He couldn't think how he merited that I— He would be shot if he could see that to what he owed— and it was Stein, Stein the merchant, who— But of course it was me he had to— I cut him short. He was not articulate, and his gratitude caused me inexplicable pain. I told him that if he owed this chance to any one especially, it was to an old Scot of whom he had never heard, who had died many years ago, and of whom little was remembered besides a roaring voice and a rough sort of honesty. There was really no one to receive his thanks— Stein was passing on to a young man the help he had received in his own young days, and I had done no more than to mention his name. Upon this he coloured, and, twisting a bit of paper in his fingers, he remarked bashfully that I had always trusted him. I admitted that such was the case, and added after a pause that I wished he had been able to follow my example. "'You think I don't?' he asked uneasily and remarked in a mutter that one had to get some sort of show first. Then, brightening up, and in a loud voice, he protested that he would give me no occasion to regret my confidence. Which, which— Do not misapprehend, I interrupted. It is not in your power to make me regret anything. There would be no regrets, but if there were, it would be altogether my own affair. On the other hand, I wished him to understand clearly that this arrangement, this, uh, this experiment, was his own doing. He was responsible for it, and no one else. Why, why, he stammered, this is the very thing that I— I begged him not to be dense, and he looked more puzzled than ever. He was in a fair way to make life intolerable to himself. Do you think so? he asked, disturbed but in a moment added confidently, I was going on, though. Was I not? It was impossible to be angry with him. I could not help a smile, 
and I told him that in the old days people who went on like this were on the way of becoming hermits in a wilderness. Hermits be hanged, he commented with engaging impulsiveness. Of course he didn't mind a wilderness. I was glad of it, I said. That was where he would be going to. He would find it lively enough, I ventured to promise. Yes, yes, he said keenly. He had shown a desire, I continued inflexibly, to go out and shut the door after him. Did I? he interrupted, in a strange access of gloom that seemed to envelop him from head to foot like the shadow of a passing cloud. He was wonderfully expressive after all. Wonderfully. Did I? he repeated bitterly. You can't say I made much noise about it. And I can keep it up, too. Only, confound it, you show me a door. Very well. Pass on, I struck in. I could make him a solemn promise that it would be shut behind him with a vengeance. His fate, whatever it was, would be ignored, because the country, for all its rotten state, was not judged ripe for interference. Once he got in, it would be for the outside world as though he had never existed. He would have nothing but the soles of his two feet to stand upon, and he would have first to find his ground at that. Never existed. <laughs> That's it, by Jove, he murmured to himself. His eyes, fastened upon my lips, sparkled. If he had thoroughly understood the conditions, I concluded, he had better jump into the first gary he could see, and drive on to Stein's house for his final instructions. He flung out of the room before I had fairly finished speaking. End of chapters 21 and 22